I'm thankful for in my soul. So with the glory in it makes me want to shout that. Oh, and every day I thank Him for His blessing. I keep on singing, Jesus is mine. an awesome God. And he's good all the time. Isn't that right? We had a great time thus far in our devotional service. We always thank Richard for the talent that God has blessed him with to lead us in our uh, spiritual songs. And he sings those songs with great intent and so uh, and it motivates, it stimulates us. And we're so thankful. Thankful to you all, each of you who do it the loss of an hour. I, I know that was tough. I know it was tough. I know it was tough. Especially if you didn't plan. But uh, God is still good. And we heard this morning, uh, in fact, I heard earlier, and, and I, I, I want to just uh, say this because just recently. good to see us. Um, and our preacher's out today traveling. He's in uh, Tulsa, Tulsa, Oklahoma. Pray that he has a safe trip back to his family. Uh, he's out uh, uh, doing the Lord's will. Uh, I know that you're ready now to hear a word from God, something to stimulate and uplift you. I'm, I'm, I'm going to go old school. Um, but uh, thank Brother Denson for reading the scripture this morning. Uh, and so I want to, because if I get long, uh, I don't want you to get weary. It's okay. It's okay. But in John chapter 19, from where Brother Denson read. Actually, th this, is, uh, this, this is during the trial of Jesus. Preparation for the trial of Jesus. I want to back up just one chapter, read just one verse out of 18, and then I'll come back to 19. And uh, we'll try to set the stage, and I'll give you the title. And I'm going to talk about myself in the title, okay? So if it's applicable to you, that's okay. I don't have no problem with it. Uh, but let's back, back up to chapter 18, verse 35. Good Bible. This is a good Bible lesson. This is foundation. You can put it in your pocket. It'll be there. The Bible says in verse 38 uh, of verse 18, Pilate said unto to him. That's you on the line? He said, the Bible said, Pilate said unto him, What is true? That's in your Bible? And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews and said unto them, I find in him. No fault at all. He said, what is truth? What is justice? The man who just a few verses earlier said, what is truth, now says, 
to his constituents. What is this? And then they has the gall doing this trial to say, take him for yourself and crucify him. For I find no fault with him. He hands Jesus over. To a bloodthirsty mob after having the gall to say, I, I find no fault with him. And so in verse, in, in chapter 19 and verse number 11, the Bible answers, and Jesus answers and said, Thou could have had no power at all against me except it would given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered me unto thee had the greater sin. And from henceforth Pilate sought to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man Thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king, speak it against Caesar. For a few minutes, I want to talk about Caesar's friend. Because Caesar still has some friends today. And I want to tell you that it's not, it's not the... Uh, the, the, the most obvious thing that you can see that goes on in life that would help you to understand. But being a friend to Caesar causes you to do some things that you would not necessarily do. Pilate had seeked his commission from the Roman Empire. And that commission was that this person who makes themselves a king, Jesus, we want to crucify. And Pilate had received it. But after deciding to do that, a pressure that is not known came upon him. And that pressure was not from God. That pressure was from his fellow men. If you let this man go, you are not Caesar's friend. And church, a lot of, lot of times in situations that we deal with that are difficult, when we evaluate the substance of that, We have to realize whether or not, especially in religious matters, whether or not we're Caesar's friend. Pilate began to make these concessions against his own conscience when they came to him and said, if you let him go, we, we're going we're gonna to tell Caesar. One thing that Pilate had, Pilate was the governor of an area. He thought about this. Caesar put me where I am. And Caesar can remove me from where I am if I don't please him. So it doesn't matter about Pilate's conviction on his own. The Jews threatened him, say, if you let him go, we're going to tell Caesar. And many times I have stop and ask myself when difficult decisions come, when things come that approach life, that challenge my faith and challenge my convictions, am I Caesar's friend? When, 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 when we go through our ups and downs and circumstances overwhelm us and we submit or we yield, can we ask the question, am I Caesar's friend? And so, so the challenge is there. And let me read a little bit of this for you, and then we'll get where we need to be. Uh, I'm kind of like my son. He had five more songs. I got at least five more points. 
No, we're not going to do that. No, 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 that's not going to work. But, it, but in verse 1, the Bible said, then, then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. And the word uh, uh, scowled him, uh, uh, that, that, that word has the idea that he was beat. He was whipped. He was flogged. You know, when uh, you're beating him, uh, that, that, that idea. Now, now, people say, well, why would he whip him if he was deciding to let him go? The whipping was a part of this decision to let him go. Because he figured if he could get the Jews to have some pity on him for just beating him, they wouldn't want to crucify him. Because the scourging, they were whipping him with the three-pronged whips, with the knuckle bone of a sheep in it, and they just peeled the skin off. And so what, what, what he's doing is trying to get those Jews to have some pity on him. And say, well, since you done beat him like this, we, maybe we won't have to kill him. But that didn't work. That's how bloodthirsty those Jews were. That didn't work. After they got through beating him, the further humiliated him, the Bible says in verse 2 and 19 that the soldiers planted a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they, 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 they put a purple robe on him. The robe was for royalty, but the crown of thorns was for humiliation. And they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him with their hands. They slapped him. Now keep in mind, Pilate had just told him, say, if you don't answer me, I have the power to release you or I have the power to crucify you. And then that question that he asked in 18, what is truth? Church folk are still searching. Let me tell you, in our culture, we're wrestling with justice. In our culture, we're wrestling with truth. And not just outside the church, but right now we're going through this culture. We're wrestling with justice and truth in the church. And the struggle seems to get bigger every day. Uh, the question is, who defines justice? What does justice mean to the church? How do we de deal with justice in the church? We see everything that's coming over this 24-hour news alert network that we have that challenge our faith and has us to think within ourselves, now, if you do this, you're not pleasing to your friend. The, the justice that we see, the injustice that we see, the, the social culture that we're dealing with. Right now we're experiencing everything and those things are challenging the church, they're challenging members, they're challenging our convictions. The social injustice that we witness every day. Amen. The economic injustice that we witness every day. Amen. The racial injustice that we, uh, that, that we see and part of this is racial. Part, Everything we see challenges our convictions to the point that we ask ourselves, am I Caesar's friend? Should I submit? It challenges us. A Christian, and as Christians, we always have pressure. When you think that you're just going along and everything is okay, Satan already got the best of you. There will always be pressure in this life. We want a life that doesn't have the that doesn't have the challenges. But as Christians, there will always we can't become satisfied with just being members of the church. Because when you sit down on your throne and do nothing and become content and satisfied, being a friend to Caesar. That, that idea, that conviction, that attitude will slip upon you. 
Peter. John chapter 18, verse 17. Peter had told Jesus, I'll follow you. You remember that? Convicted too. Jesus had to tell him, look here, Peter. Foxes have holes, uh, birds of air have nests. I don't have nowhere to lay my head. Peter said, don't worry about that. I'm, I'm going to follow you anywhere. So in that whole chapter, 18, when he was led out to the platorium, the uh, first thing that happened when they led him in, in the hall of platorium, they grabbed a hold to him because one of his own disciples uh, sold him for 30 pieces of silver. Peter drawed his sword. Lord, when I get to heaven, I'll see. Peter, you got an Afro, Afro, uh, Afro-American in you because you drew, drew your sword out and cut the man's ear off. Jesus had to tell him, put, put that sword up. That, that's what this is. This is not about that. But the idea in 1817, the Bible said that when those little maidens came and point Peter out and say, you were one of them. In fact, they said, your speech betrayed you. And Peter said, I wasn't with them. She said, your speech betrayed you. She kept accusing him. Do we know what Peter did? Start cussing. Start cussing. And the first thing that he did, Brother Tony, he said, I was not one of them. I was not with them. And I say this because when you become a friend to Caesar, the very first thing that we do is start denying the faith. Not to the degree that Peter did, but we do do it to a degree. Peter started cussing. Ain't none of us went back to that yard. Start denying Jesus. I don't know him. And he just, just a few verses ago, he said, Lord, I'll follow you anywhere. I'll go wherever you go. Peter, I don't have no place to lay my head. Don't make no difference. And now this challenge comes, and the challenge is not difficult. It's just a question. You were with him. Weren't you with him? No, I wasn't with him. Here you were, sir. Your speech betrayed you. And I could just see Peter. Of course, I have seen Peter in me. But you keep telling me I was with him. Start cursing and acting ignorant. I say that not to be facetious, but that's just how sin works. And so when you have to investigate yourself many times because this is real. Many folk today that started out on this journey with us have allowed become friends of Caesar and it's stolen their joy. Used to be up and active. They get to the back door, to the back seat, out the door. Don't see it. You're a friend of Caesar. Allow someone to challenge you with false doctrine. When we accept it, when we don't, when we don't stand up, in spite of the difficulties, in spite of those numbers against, we have to stand on truth. Jesus tells us in John 17, 17, we should know the truth. And the truth. What is truth? 
He said, sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. And if you're ever going to, I'm not, I'm not saying that to just, just, just uh, make you feel good. If you, if you ever want to have a strong foundation to stand on when the contrary winds of life and they going to blow, they're not blowing in your life now. Just keep living. You need truth. And here, 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 here is, here is old Pilate saying, well, what, what, what is truth? The truth is, he knew the truth. And the bad thing about it is when you know the truth and struggle with yourself. Pilate knew the truth. He knew that Jesus was God's son. That's why in, in, this, in, in, in 19, I'll wait for you. Turn there. I want to read something to you. John 19, verse 19 of, of, of John 19. The Bible says, And Pilate wrote a title, put it on a cross, and the writing was Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. You see that? Now I want to tell you, when you don't stand on truth, this is what happens. Watch what Pilate does. The Bible says, now watch him now. He says, this, this title then read, Many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was nigh to the city, and it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. Then said the chief priest of the Jews to Pilate, right now, in other words, don't, don't, don't put that inscription up there. He said, right now, don't write it. Watch, watch, watch what happens. He said, the king of the Jews, but he said, I'm the king of the Jews. And then he says, and Pilate answered, what I've written, I've written. In other words, the Jews were saying, don't, don't, don't write, say he's the king of the Jews. Why don't we just say that he said he was? Rather than document it, let's just say he said he was. But Pilate knew who Jesus was. He knew he had truth. And so he said, what I've written, I've written. And how many times have we made concessions against our own conscience doing that? When we know what's right and don't stand. Especially in the heat of the battle. You know what I mean? In the heat of the battle. Once we get out of it. I should have said that. No, it's too late now. Man, I was waiting on my break to tell him. No, you wasn't. You wasn't going to say nothing. I say that not being facetious, church, but if, when the, if the church has the foundation of the church, the church is right. But, but we, we can't waffle and waver in faith when challenges come. Let me tell you, as long as we on this earth, I don't care how long you've been in the church, you're going to have challenges. And some of them will be from outside. Amen. But don't be disappointed. Some of them will be from inside. The example is there that Pilate, who himself is a Jew, but he has, he's up against losing his job. He's up against losing his friendship. He don't know where he's going to go if he loses his job and his friendship. And so when those Jews challenge him, you better not let him go. You ever been put in a situation like that? Maybe not since you've been an adult. Maybe you have. But as a child, you always was. You knew you always had some friends. They want you on their side. If you're going to be Richard's friend, you can't be my friend. You know that. And they, and they let you know that. And here you are, put in a dilemma. But when you're young, it doesn't make a difference, you know. 
Because you're going to follow the one that's got the most candy anyway. <laughs> yeah, if he got more candy. You know, Smitty got money, he can get candy every day. Norton ain't got no money. He's going to get candy. So I don't follow <laughs> you know, that's, a, that's how we make choices in life. What's, what's in it for us? How can I benefit from my choices? I was reading the other day, and they said there is two rungs on the ladder of success that every person ought to include in their life. Two rungs on the ladder of success. All you successful folks in here ought to know those. Two of those rungs. You know what two rungs they are? One is the friends you choose on the ladder of success. And that's, I would think, friends? Yeah. And the other one is books you read. And both of them, they say, you need to choose carefully. The books you read and the friends you choose. You know what that says? Everybody you choose for a friend may not be a friend. They may not have the same idea or they may not have the makeup of a friend. So you got to be careful in choosing. So are you Caesar's friend? Then uh, there are always forces that are working uh, to, to, to try to dethrone what our idea is. But I want to tell you, here, here's the other thing. Uh, when you become a friend of Caesar, you want to deny the faith. And the other one will cause you to, the, the other point is, a friend of Caesar will cause you to ignore good advice. That's how his wife tried to advise him. Matthew chapter 27, 19, she said, don't have anything to do with this just man. He should have wanted to listen. But pressure. The pressure of being Caesar's friend made him ignore that advice. Now he used the term, I'm just going to wash my hands, but he didn't mean it. He tried to push the responsibility, the accountability on all of those Jews. He said, listen, I don't find no fault with it. Y'all do what you want to with it. But it was his decision. And I, I say that because there are things that we don't, we, it's, it has, not, has nothing to do with physical crucifixion, but we have crucified folks that we know. Amen, lights. And because there was no physical reaction, physical judgment, it was okay. And we did it because it was Caesar's friend. Now let me tell you how that worked. Misery loves company. If I don't like Smith, I'm sure it won't get y'all to help me. I'm going to tell y'all everything that I can bad about Smith because I don't want you to be around Smith. In fact, I've already done it, have no. <laughs> And misery loves company. And after, after uh, Pilate decided to make his decision, and even when he thought he was right and moved in a different direction, he stood on ill-advised information just to please somebody else. And I say that when it comes to serving God, you serve God for what you know. You thank God for what he did. He provided salvation by sending his son and his son shedding his blood, giving you a way to be reconciled. Stop listening at the evil winds blowing. Make that decision yourself. And when you make the decision, Stand on it. Don't make no difference who else don't make the decision. When you make the decision, 
We used to sing the song, I have decided to follow Jesus. When you make that decision to follow, follow him. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. And so these Jews tried to tell him that, hey, he's not our king. He's not our king. We have our own king. They didn't have a king, but they wanted to have a king. They made him king of the Jews. And they said, we, we don't follow him. We don't respect him. You know, in real life, and I'm, we're all aware of this based on what this political climate and everything else that we went through, you can have somebody that's uh, in charge that has no effect on you. You don't have to like them, but to make them in charge, they're still going to be in charge whether you like them or not. I had a, I had a boss over, the, over my time of working that was similar to that. Always found something to complain about, so much so that I decided I didn't like him. But the fact that I didn't like him didn't change the fact that he's still my boss. And so that, that's the way it was in the situation here, in, in this that, that we're going through. Uh, we have to continue to uh, uh, navigate our way toward trying to live for the Lord in spite of the idea who we think that our friend was. It, it doesn't turn us away from good advice. Let me tell you. Good advice never hurt anybody. We are intelligent enough to decipher what's good and what's bad. And so when Pilate's wife gave him some good advice, some good advice, and I used to serve with some guys who said, man, you know what? I don't let my wife tell me nothing. I done bought four or five uh, motors to put in my car because uh, my wife told me to go get a new car. Well, you might have been better off getting a new car. Cause certainly if you bought four or five motors that didn't work, you paid for one. Sometimes it's good to listen to good advice. When people are trying to encourage you about your spirituality, about your spiritual life, sometimes it's good to listen. That doesn't mean they know everything, but they may have some advice for you that, that's profitable toward your Christianity, toward your living for Jesus, toward your being able to grow and develop and be stronger than you are, to stand against the wiles of Satan. And sometimes it's good to listen. Pilate had no backbone. I think I counted five times in the book of John, verse chapter 18 and 19 combined, where he told those Jews, I find no fault in the man. And if that's true, you're the governor, you could have stopped all this. But now, I, w I do want to tell you this. He could have stopped it, but I want to tell you, God was using him as an instrument. He, he wasn't even aware of it, but that's what God was using. God, God knew it all about Pilate. Knew about his background, his character. Knew that he had no uh, accountability. And so God was using him. He, God could have messed around and got somebody that had some accountability. I didn't have any. So even though Pilate, as we read from the scripture, is directly responsible with those Jews for the death of Christ, God had already fixed that. Because he needed a perfect blood. He needed the shedding of a perfect blood. He had already promised us a savior. And so he used Pilate to do that. And so when we, when we realize that that scripture had to be fulfilled, even though we read about all the harsh elements and everything that Jesus experienced, those things that bring heartburn to our heart, not this, this heart, God already had it fixed. 
And I say that because when we experience what we experience in life as Christians on a day-to-day -day basis, if we would just stop and have a talk with Jesus through our prayer, And we don't know how he's going to work it out. But he'll fix it. Somebody said, let him fix it. He knows just what to do. You know what bothers me when people have those kind of anxieties, especially religiously. They always talk about, well, as soon as I get it straight, I'm going to come to Jesus. You mean to tell me you're an intelligent person, you walk around your life in a mess, and you can straighten out and you won't do it? That don't make sense, does it? First of all, you can't fix it. The reason it's in a mess, because I've been trying to fix it. Let someone else fix it. And then, and then as we move forward, Not only will it cause you to deny faith, not only will it cause you to ignore good advice, but friend to Caesar will also cause you to lose your soul. That's what Pilate was geared toward doing when he knew what was right and refused to do it. James said, for those to know to do good, to him to know to do good. And do it not. To him it's what? To him it's a sin. I mean, when you know that when you know that you are wrong, fix it. Don't walk around with it fixed. Unfixed. And you can fix it. Relationships are destroyed by the world. Friendships are destroyed. Here is a mass deduction here. But friendships are destroyed that way. Relationships are destroyed that way. Marriages are destroyed that way. When there needs to be fixed. And you know what? We all like children. But I didn't start it. Does it really make a difference? When it's broke, fix it. This thing here now, the palace probably said to him, I didn't start all this. I was letting the man go. No, you were letting him go verbally, but you did not actually release him. You could have fixed all of this. And I say that because church as Christians, these challenges that we have are not just our time. They real. And when we know Jesus speaks, uh, when you have an odd against a brother, what do you say? Go tell all your friends. <laughs> it's a, if you've got an odd against, go to him alone. Yeah, but, and, and you know the reason why we normally don't go? Because we already done figured out what the other person's going to say. They ain't going to accept the know how I already know. How you know? Jesus said, if you got it, go to him alone and fix it. But he didn't say, if his attitude is not right, then leave it alone. Even if his attitude is not right, he gives you a prescription anyway. Because if he doesn't hear you, take two or three more with you. And if you don't hear them, bring him forth to church. Our remedy won't fix that. But God's remedy will. That's all that. And we see from that whole crucifixion, that whole way. Matthew's account, Mark's account, Luke's account, John's account, everything in those accounts.
Here is a man who is, and I want to tell you, Pilate wasn't an ignorant man. He had some knowledge. He was a military leader before he became a girl. He had a lot of things going for him. On the ball, he was not ignorant. He was just weak. He just wanted to be Caesar's friend. And I say that, church. I pray that we're not gaping or grasping just to be associated with Caesar. Because what Pilate missed was Caesar wasn't going to be able to save his soul. Caesar didn't shed his blood for him. Jesus did. And I say that to us. You may have a physical attraction or a physical attachment, but none of that will save our soul. Jesus has died shed his blood, and established a way for us to be reconciled, reconciliation back to God the Father. And it's only through his blood. The Bible declares, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Blood had to be shed. Not just any blood. Lord needed a perfect blood, and it was his son. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says it. That he struggled for us, that he endured the cross for us. And I tell you this morning, church, that if you see this friend, you can rise above that. We got time. That's, that's the purpose of us going back and studying and extracting positive from the lesson. We can rise above that. We can put on the whole armor of God and fight the good fight of faith. We can start this morning. We don't have to wait for a gospel meeting. We don't have to wait for a special visit. We don't have to wait for any of that. Let me tell you something. Time is winding up. Our salvation is nearer today than it was yesterday. And if God allows us to go through this whole day, it will be nearer tomorrow than it is today. So for, in order for us to make our peace calling and election sure, we need to make preparations. Not to have that be attacked with that and, and possess a, a Caesar attitude. But be real with God. We saying that God is real. Why aren't we? We saying that God is real. He is. Even when we're in our fight for our life, fight for our faith, struggle, even when we're going through our darkest times, God is still there. Even when you, it seems that everyone has deserted you and left you, God is still there. And he's still real. And the Bible says in Romans chapter 8 that he sent his son to die for us while we were just wretched So he died. Why? He didn't wait till we got right to us. God didn't wait till we got right. He provided a way to be reconciled before we got right. And even after we get right, I've been, I'm guilty. Even after we get right, hear the gospel, obey it. Even after we get right, we slip. We fall back in. You know, Romans chapter 7, Paul said, the things that I know to do, he said, I don't do them. But the things I ain't got no business doing, that's what I do. He said, that's what I do. Now, I, I know some of us have that Paul mentality. We've, we've been in the same place. 
And those that say, no, I haven't brought coffee, you seize this from them. It's not a shame. It's not a shame. It's not a shame. That just helps us to understand that this, this journey, this journey is a tedious journey. I know that. You know that. Some days we up here. But isn't it funny? You can't be up here every day. Some days we're in our valleys. We have those valley experiences, and I know that some folks can't break up. I ain't never had no valley experience. Yours is lying. You're having it right now. All of us have had it. But the thing that, that we can rejoice about is that Jesus himself has promised us. Hebrews 13, 5, he said, I'll never leave you. Nor forsake. Even when you are having your valley experiences, you're not alone. And when you're having your mountaintop glory, you're not alone. And so in conclusion, in conclusion, I'm concluding. If you're here this morning, and let's say that you have obeyed the gospel, but you're still struggling. Let me tell you something. That's not shame. That's not shame. The shame is if you've heard the gospel and refused to obey it. That's the shame. The shame is if you heard the gospel, obeyed it, but you're still struggling. Let me tell you something. People are going to struggle. That's why we have to get up every day to make our peace calling and election sure. We have to prepare and work every day. Because Satan is, he's, he's working on us. And see, most people, let me tell you something, obeying the gospel, getting baptized, that's easy. You know where the task comes in? Day-to-day -day living. Day-to-day -day living. You can walk out your door, smile, everything bright, everything going good, get in your automobile, drive down to the corner, and there's some guy down there. Uh, uh, him and his wife, they 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 uh, fussing and arguing, got traffic tied up. Or it could be her fixing her hair in the mirror. Or it could be him. Doesn't have to be any of that. You know, used to get me. I had to pray about it, brother Will. Get on the expressway. Get in the fast lane, Smitty. The expressway signs say seventy-five, and you get in the fast lane. You running a little bit late, Chris, for work. And there is this guy in front of you driving 35. And you're saying, why don't you get over there where you're supposed to be? Blowing the horn. You even say, Lord, move him, please. But the Lord say, he's there to fix you. You drive right up on, I'll fix him. Drive right up on his bumper. The Lord say, no, he ain't going to move. And he sure doesn't. And then when he decides to move, he's smiling. <laughs> Man, why you got to be like all oh, that? But, I mean, those things happen in life. They're real. But for us, the blood still cleanses us. John declares John chapter 1, 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light. He's in the light. We can have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all our sins. If you're here this morning, you need to come. Think about it. Pray about it. Think about it. But the invitation has been extended. Jesus himself said, come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn of me. He says, for I'm meek, and you'll find rest for yourself. He says, for my yoke is easy. My burdens are light. 
Can you do that this morning? Don't, you know, don't, don't let Caesar snuff this, out, this opportunity out. When I say Caesar, don't let, let looking at other folk look at you snuff this out. I'm going to Jesus. I'm not going to have a free Caesar friend tendencies. I'm going to Jesus. Come by here and believe and repent and confess it. And we're going to be buried in baptism. We're going to ask you to come. Richard's going to stand. We're going to stand and Richard's going to lead us in song. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are, Are you washed in the blood, blood of the Lamb? Lamb? Are you full?